I will call this uh, uh, August 7th uh, regular meeting of the DRB to order. Thank you all for coming and uh, being flexible with us being remote. Um, I will turn over to Meredith for a review of our uh, remote meeting procedures and um, then we'll go from there. Awesome. I'll have to excuse me a little bit. I've got slightly different setup than I'm used to, so I won't always be looking right at the camera. Um, okay, so, oh, and of course, where Sorry. did I put my script? Here we go. <laughs> All right, so for those who are viewing tonight's um, development review board meeting via Orca Media, you can participate in the meeting via the Zoom platform through either video or telephone access options. So for the full video experience, you can type this link into your web browser and um, it should bring you right into the meeting. I'll get a little notice to let you in. Um, alternatively, you can dial in using this phone number and this passcode, our meeting ID actually, um, you know, put that in when prompted. If you're having problems accessing the meeting, please email me at mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. I will be monitoring my email throughout the meeting. Um, for those who are already participating in the Zoom meeting, turning on your video is optional. Um, for everyone attending, please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This will reduce background noise. Um, and please note that the Zoom chat function should be used only for troubleshooting or logistics questions. Um, if you have a question or comment about a specific item on the agenda, one of the specific applications, please raise your hand either physically if you have your video on or by using the raise hand button on your Zoom toolbar. Um, and then once you have been called on by the chair, um, please make sure to provide your full name and address for the record if you're not one of the applicants. Um, that way we'll know who's making the comments. Um, please note that in the event the public is unable to access today's meeting, um, it will need to be continued to a time, place, and certain, and I would get notice of that access issue through my email. I'll now hand the meeting back over to the chair. All right. Thank you, Meredith. Um, I'll accept a motion for the agenda approval. Make a motion to approve the agenda. Second. Most of motion by Sharon, second by Alex. Uh, all those in favor of approving the agenda, agenda. Well, sorry, we should probably do a roll call since it is uh, the Zoom platform. Sharon, how do you vote? Uh, yes. Catherine? Yes. Alex? Yes. Michael? Yes. Brian? Yes. Myself, Rob votes yes. Did I miss anybody? Nope, that's six. All righty. Wonderful. Thank you. The, we have an agenda for tonight. Um, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining us uh, over our Zoom platform. We have uh, two applications for this evening. Um, thank you to applicants for your patience, too, in the delay. Obviously, it was uh, <laughs> warranted due to the flood uh, and whatnot, but uh, here we are. And um, without uh, further ado, we can move on to uh, our first order of business uh, for the evening, which would be the 11 9 Street application related to uh, a, a um, fence uh, construction. And uh, who is here to um, present on the 9 Street application? Hi, me and my husband are present. My name is Alyssa and this is Eldon. Hello. Okay. So anyone else that um, uh, would like to speak on this application uh, this evening um, that is not the applicants? Okay, looks like we are swearing in two people as witnesses. Um, so all those interested in providing testimony on this application, would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in as a witness? Oh, there we go. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? We do. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Meredith, do you want to start by uh, just a brief overview? Then we will we'll turn it over to the applicants, and then the DRB will 
proceed with questions or comments or however uh, we do we do it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna just keep this really short. Um, yeah. This is an application for a fence that is in the side yard. The request is to have it more than the standard six feet max height because it's acting as a privacy fence. I don't have authority to grant that, but the board does. So the board is here. There's no, you know, specific criteria. It's not like a waiver or a variance per se. It's a um, board exception that they can make, um, including for privacy reasons, um, screening. So that's all I got, really. Great. Um, so we'll have the applicants, um, you know, give a little presentation, but I'll just let you know that you know, like Meredith said, this is very brief. It's related to the, <laughs> you know, the fence. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm sure there's, you have a number of other great things going on with this project, uh, yeah. but the DRB is, uh, you know, very interested in uh, your your reasons for specifically of the fence, the extension of height. Um, so, uh, you know, tell us what you're dealing with and uh, welcome to the DRB. Sure, hi, thanks for the welcome. Um... It's nice to meet all of you. Thanks for being here. We are requesting an eight foot fence for a length of about 35 feet between the back edge of the back of our house, 35 feet into the backyard that goes between our home and Nine Vine Street, uh, the Nicolettes. Um, ourselves and our neighbors are in agreement that an eight foot fence would provide some privacy. Since we moved into our home at 11 Vine Street, there used to be no access to the backyard at all. And since we've moved in, we put in a back door and a window, which seems very reasonable. Um, however, the proximity to Nine Vine Street, the window and the door now basically have eye level access from our living room into their living room. So particularly in the winter and uh, particularly at night, but really any time of day, we basically have eye level um, eyesight to one another from our living rooms which like we have an amiable relationship but don't want to hang out when we choose not to <laughs> so we are hoping to put an eight foot fence at uh you know about 35 feet from the back of our house that would block that eye level meeting um essentially so that's yeah that's i would say sums up our application for why we are requesting this uh variation and what the city usually allows and maybe I'll just throw in there that like we kind of were brainstorming with those guys, like what the best way to go about it is. And like we all kind of like want there to be vegetation there as well. But like in the meantime, sort of to make everything like livable in both living rooms, like, yeah, just the privacy fence seemed like the best option. Yeah. So if you're saying the long-term plan is to have a vegetation screen between the two, but uh, the fence is the, the immediate uh, immediate fix. Yeah, over the next like two decades, we hope some tree, we are we, they have already planted some trees, and we plan to plant some plant some trees, uh, but those take time to grow. And so in the meantime, we would like to have this fence to provide some privacy for both families. Wonderful, Sharon. Uh, yeah, I um. I found the application you had asked for an eight and a half foot high fence and you just kept oh. saying eight foot. You're right. Which, which is it? Eight, eight and a half. Yep. Eight okay. foot six. Yes. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. What we, what we did to figure that out was kind of like we stood in our living room and they stood in theirs and it was like, where are the two tallest people's eyes like not going to meet anymore? <laughs> and then we had like a stick outside that we had measurements on and we were like, Oh, like, eight foot like if we're both standing up we're still seeing each other so maybe like just get that extra yeah so then eight six was kind of like the perfect number for the privacy factor yeah okay thanks yeah wonderful um i mean i think it's great that you and your neighbor both very much agree with it <laughs> i think that very much very much narrows our scope of review of this application um so I guess just one question for Meredith, like, so there are, there are fence, this is a side yard fence. Is it the front yard that would like, we have less uh, leeway on when it comes to height variance? Yeah. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Side and, and rear, you have a lot, you have more leeway and it's, it's a lot, um, 
less well defined about what exceptions are allowed. Um, there's general categories of exceptions versus that front yard fence where it's very, very specific. Um, and, you know, the other, other, one of the things that I thought made this one a little bit easier is that it's not like it's the entire side property boundary. Um, and so the fence isn't going to be interfering in, you know, lines of sight, anything like that um, along the road, even pedestrian lines of sight. Um, but yeah, you've got, it's the, it's the front yard that's much more strict. Any other DRB members have any questions? Nope. No questions from me. None from me either. If they were all this straightforward, we'd have 20 minute meetings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I'd like to make a motion if that's uh, acceptable. Uh, the motion to grant privacy fence exception in the to the usual maximum fence site of section 3101E, allowing applicants request for an A and a eight and eight foot six inch tall uh <laughs> 35 foot long fence at 11 vine street adjacent to the boundary with nine vine street as presented in the application number z 20230076 and supporting and supplemental materials motion by sharon all second Second by Catherine. Um, so we have a motion on the table for approval of the application as um, submitted. And um, do we have any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we will start with a roll call vote. Um, since Sharon's at the top of my screen. Sharon, how do you vote? Yes. Alex? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Brian? You're muted. Yeah. Yes, Rob, sorry. Now you're all right. Michael? Yes. Uh, Rob, myself votes yes. Um, that is a unanimously approved as yes. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Alyssa Eldon, just so you know, the uh, formal decision isn't until you get the written decision um, because there were no conditions. The written decision and the permit will get issued at the same time. Um, we'll probably just email or call you when those are ready because mail in Montpelier is still a little tricky. Yeah. Um, and so we'll let you know when those are ready and you'll need to come down and get those. And there's um, technically a 30 day appeal period after that written decision. Um, anything you do in that window is just gonna be at your own risk, um, given that nobody has shown up to complain about your fence and you already have an agreement with your neighbors, the risk there is probably pretty low. Awesome, thank you so much. I appreciate everybody's time and reading the application and so grateful for the approval. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good night. You too, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, next order of business um, is Six Parkside Drive. Um, so who is here tonight to uh, represent the applicant on Six Parkside Drive? Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Jolly, and uh, myself and my wife, Jean, are here. Jo Jean Jolly's here also. Bill and Jean, all right, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll just hold on one second. Uh, anyone else here uh, on the platform to speak on this application? Um, I, I wanted to um, share some thoughts about it as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Bill. Um, Great. Um, so uh, we will uh, swear those in wishing to speak um, on this application. All those interested in providing uh, testimony on this application, would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in as witness? I assume then we will need to uh, uh, open the camera. Well, you can if you'd like, but uh, we trust you, Bill. Required. Oh no, that's that's okay. Let's see if it works. 
There we go. Right, that does work. Beautiful. It does oh, work. It does work. Oh, right here. Great. Hang on Thank second. you very much. <laughs> uh, there we go. Uh, we're, we're ready. There we go. All right. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? Yes, yes. I do. Yes, I do. I, do. I hear three Sorry. yeses. Uh, we are good. Um, great. Um, so I guess we'll start. Um, Meredith, she can give us a brief overview of procedural status where we're at on this application. Um, and we'll turn it over to you, uh, Bill, for the um, yes, telling us what, what, what you're doing here. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, this is, again, a little bit similar, though slightly more complicated than the last one, in that um, normally boundary line adjustments are something that are approved administratively. Um, in this particular instance, there's a little bit of a twist so that as zoning administrator, I really didn't feel like I could approve it. Um, and I actually touched base with the city's attorneys about that to make sure. Um, so generally speaking, if a boundary line adjustment creates a nonconformity, creates a situation where a parcel no longer complies with a um, dimensional requirement, um, you know, and creates that that condition, then um, you can't do a boundary line adjustment. You have to do a subdivision, or in some cases, you have to then go to the board to have the approval happen. In this instance, the boundary line adjustment doesn't actually create the what I'm referring to as the nonconformity. The fact that a one of the parcels doesn't have any frontage um, that nonconformity is already there. It was created um, in a prior subdivision under a prior set of zoning regulations. Um, what this boundary line adjustment does is it reverses that condition. So instead of, you know, I'm just going to say parcel A having no frontage, now parcel B will have no frontage. It's directly reversing it, changing the access um, easement, changing which parcel has the frontage. Um, I, as a zoning administrator with very, very limited ability to, to work in the gray zone, can't make that approval, um, but um, the board has that authority and it, it does not make it a subdivision. No new parcel is being created. So it's still not a subdivision. So we don't have to look at every single subdivision requirement. Um, I've included in the staff report a few of the ones that seem to be um, applicable or that um, where neighbors have raised some questions like about stormwater or about water sewer um, that generally you don't look at for a boundary line adjustment, but I've thrown those in there in the staff report um, in response to those, those questions and, and, and thoughts just to make sure that you had the full picture. Um, but there's, there's nothing being created here. We're just adjusting some of the prior conditions of approval from, I can't remember if it was 2003 or 2005 off the top of my head. Great. Um, all right. So Mark, I mean, not, I'm sorry, Mark, Bill and Jolly, we'll uh, turn over to you. Bill and Jean. Bill and Jean. Bill and Jean. Sorry. That's uh, okay. Bill and Jean. <laughs> Bill and Jean. Um, I, just for a graphic while you're going here, since we aren't in the uh, room, I'm going to share my screen and put your uh, um, survey of your proposal up. And then you can go ahead and sort of talk a little bit about your project project and where you came and where you're going and um, um, what uh, the board is reviewing. Okay, I'll, I'll start by uh, saying that we really have nothing to add. We uh, feel very strongly that uh, Meredith has done an excellent job of stating the facts in this situation and that our motivation really is just to um, move ownership 
uh, to the parcel that we live on. That's really it. It's probably something that could have been done years ago, uh, like since 2003 or even 2005. Um, but we felt that maybe we probably should get around to it. And all we want to do is change the uh, the ownership to the, the land we live on. That's really pretty much it. And that's I think that's all that uh, this does. Ownership of the right of way or the uh, the easement in common that uh, Meredith refers to in her statements. Okay. Um. So uh, obviously, the lot we live on is the one with the house on it, um, and um, and that's what we're doing, just moving the uh, uh, the ownership of the uh, right of way and the easement in common to the lot we live on that the house is on instead of the one that the house is not on that we don't live on. That's really all that's happening. Cool. So you're in lot two there? In this drawing? Yeah. It's always been confusing to me whether it's lot one or two, but in this map. lot that has the house on. Yeah, in the drawing, it's pretty small right now, but it, uh, I see it as lot two and then lot I think one it says lot two. Right. Okay. Yeah, I usually refer to it as the smaller lot, the larger lot, a lot easier. But yeah, it's um, a a to b. You know, uh, uh, either one. It's from one to two. I think I read something in the application about the um, that lot one and there's retained some kind of access easement. Is that correct? Uh. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what your question is. Uh, that there is. Um, I, I was just, I, I thought that in the application it referred to uh, an easement um, so that there's still access to lot one. Is that correct? Uh, if I understand your question, Ron, I think Miranda states it's in her, in her uh, documents that originally. The easement belong and it still does uh, belongs to lot one, and they convey that to lot two. Well, all we're doing now is having the easement belong to lot two that will be conveyed to lot one. So they're both. It's in a sense in common, and I think it states that on the uh, the site plan that this is an easement in common. From what I understand, and really, I'd refer to a, a, a land surveyor uh, who did this. Uh, but the easement in common means it belongs to both properties. They're both allowed to uh, use that easement. Did that answer your question? Because I'm not sure I really fully understood it. Meredith, can you just clarify there for briefly? Oh, I mean, like I'm, I'm thinking what was I was saw in the in the in the uh, application in the staff report, I thought that there was an easement that was. Yep. Yeah. So, so um, here, this, this little, these arrows here show where the, the current property boundary is. So there's a current property line here. So that lot two ends at this point. Okay. And lot so, two. Yeah, that's so that's where, that's where Bill right and Jean now. live. Right, they have a access and utility easement over this land, this driveway, to get to Parkside Drive, um, and the the subdivision in two thousand three or two thousand five. It's in the staff report. Um, laid out a a access easement here that actually was, I think, less than fifty feet. Now those parcel lines are going to be erased, so and a new one drawn here. Just okay. this little bit here is going to be yeah. drawn so that all of this existing gravel driveway, all of this 50 foot wide and a little bit wider here land will then be transferred to lot two, but proposed 50 foot access and utility easement to lot one. There's the, the access and utility easement over this driveway will, it'll be actually be widened under the legal language to 50 feet, which is the the sort of max that's required in our, our regulations. Um, so that lot 
Now, lot one is the one that has to travel over lot two's land, okay. right? But the yeah. easement is um, for the benefit of lot one. So that's it, it's tricky about the ownership. You're owning the land, and then there's an easement for the benefit of the property that doesn't own the land. Right. Um, okay. So yes, that that easement that easement will be there, um, and the the application package, I believe, had language in there about the easement. I'm sorry, I've done yeah, some things did. so far. <laughs> I've, I've, it's been a little bit, a little bit of a blur over the last month. Um, so that would be recorded. Um, Thanks for clarifying that. That's, that's what I thought I, I understood it to say. Yeah. And I just wanted to make sure that that was correct. Yep. Thank yep. you. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. Yeah. You're welcome, Bill. <laughs> Anyone else on the board have any questions or do you all feel confident about you know the easement and what lines going where and sort of understand what's going on here seeing nods yes um okay well let's go in and look at some issues here um or some items highlighted in the uh in the staff report um um just Overall here, it does appear that we're sort of simplifying things for the future, and uh, um, that is the um, the goal of this. Um, I'm not seeing this as some uh, loophole attempt to do a subdivision without doing a subdivision. <laughs> this seems pretty, uh, you know, straightforward to clean up effort uh, to me. Um, but uh, so we'll go through the report here and um, just take a look. Um, I think, you know, some of this is in you know in many ways um you know reviewing this as if it were um you know a subdivision um when this is you know i think meredith must determine that this was a boundary line adjustment i tend to you know agree um and um so one of the things we uh we look at um in a subdivision is uh you know review is to making sure that it doesn't create any non-conformities um well, I don't think that uh, Meredith identified any nonconformities to to exist, uh, and this is actually, you know, you know, it's the word nonconformities. It's probably that we missed. It's probably resolving them. <laughs> uh, it's, it's making things a little bit more straightforward, um, as if this sort of property were developed um, in present day with the present present day regs. Um, so I don't see any issue with. Uh, the first um, uh, item here, that would be, if you're following along, that's page seven of the staff report. Um, and uh, with reference to section 3510 of the, uh, the regulations. And um, moving down here, um, page, uh, page eight of the staff report, we've got, um, you know, the configuration, the parcel boundaries, uh, I think, Looking at the map here, how this is being drawn, I don't see it issue there. Now they did staff. Um, I feel like my cursor skipped down and I skipped a couple pages for some reason. Um, let's I miss something. Rob, your audio is a little shaky. Maybe stop sharing your screen. Your bandwidth may not be quite enough for audio, visual, and sharing screen. Here we go. Is that better? It is yeah. better. Wonderful. I can share screen if we need to again. No, I think we're good. Um, yeah, my sorry, my computer's <laughs> clicked down to page seven of the staff report. Um, so on page four, which is you know the beginning of the staff analysis, um, we uh, you know have some have some comments about. Um, the uh, you know existing parcels and the minimum frontage. Um, this is uh, sections 30, 3002, 3003 of the you know dimensional standards. Um, we don't um, you know see any issues there. This is not this adjustment's not really changing any of that. Um, and uh, board members, uh, any comments? Seeing any differently? I 
All right. A lot of head shaking. Seeing, seeing none, seeing affirmative head shaking. Um, I'll go down and, you know, uh, there are some comments here um, raising no issues about stormwater management. Um, you know, once again, not much is changing as far as the development of the parcel. We're just changing the line really to sort of update things um, to the present use and, uh, you know, a configuration here. Um, I think the same goes for, uh, you know, vehicle access and circulation, which is section 3010 on page six, um, parking and loading areas. Um, we have a similar um, thing where we, you know, don't see any issues, um, that's, don't see any changes. Um, and uh, I guess now we're back to where I started on page seven about the non-conformities. <laughs> and uh, I Oh, I don't. I don't see much of much much of an issue here. Uh, it, it seems a little uh, straightforward to me. Could Mark want to testify about something? Yeah, thank you, uh, Sharon. Uh, Mark, how uh, would you like to uh, chime in here? Um, well, I'm. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, thanks for including me. Um, I'm Mark Billion, and my wife, Ann Brynn, and I live at 37 Bailey. We're one of the neighbors that were notified about the application. And we've been neighbors with Bill and Jean since they first constructed their house many years ago. And um, they've been terrific neighbors to us, allowing us to access the park through the land behind our home. They've cleared trails for us and... Um, we, a couple of years ago, Bill and I worked together on building an access um, bridge so that others in the neighborhood could use it. So, um, so we're really familiar with the with the area, uh, the property. Um, Bill and Jean, I don't know if if Meredith told you, but um, I recently went through the same process looking at a boundary line adjustment because we also had a non-conforming property. Um, there had been some changes made to our house. It ate up the um, the lot the uh, um, setbacks, so we ended up moving our one of our rear pins on our property with the help of Rick Bell, just to bring the property back into a conforming status. So we had to go through all the same process, including the state's um, waste stormwater um, process, and we had to retain a uh, the use the help of an engineer to get that approved. So, you know, with all of that in mind, um, we completely believe in the boundary line pro um, process, boundary line adjustment process. It's, it's a really great way for us to head off problems that we would probably encounter in a few years if we decided to sell our home or, or change its use. So we completely support um, Bill and Jean's um, boundary line adjustment application. And as Bill said, it was a terrific document, Meredith. Thank you for all the work you put into it. It helped, really helped me understand how those items are, um, you know, impact this. Um, so you might ask, why am I here? Why am I speaking? And um, it's because the last time I appeared before the DRB, um, it was also to address this property. This was when Bill and Jean were first considering building their house and at that meeting, um, the chair, I believe, was Phil Zellinger. And Phil politely listened to me talk about my concerns about stormwater. And when I was done, he told me that since I'm not an engineer, um, nor was I represented by an engineer, there really wasn't anything they could do to respond to my concerns. Um, I'm not an engineer, and neither are my neighbors. And um, all we can do is, uh, as you know, members of the neighborhood, is we kind of respond to stormwater events like the, the recent one we had, um, which resulted in a great deal of damage on our home and and then to neighbors. So, um, you know, that's why we I'm sort of looking to Meredith and the DRB um, team to act as our advocates um, because we. Um, because you you both or you all know what uh, what the regulations are and the best way to protect Gene and and Bill's property and also ours. So again, I just want to say that we support the application, 
And I just want, I know there is no application, there's no proposal right now to develop lot one. So there shouldn't be any change in st stormwater events um, based upon the boundary line. But um, should things change in the future, I guess we're going to look to you, um, the board, just to guide us through how do we navigate this process, just to ensure that um, Bill and Jean are protected and all of our neighbors are protected as well. So that's all I wanted to say. I think the key, key part of one of the things you said there is that any future development, like then if there were any kind of development out there, um, you know, there, that's when uh, stormwater review would kick in. There's like a bunch of places and opportunities to do that. Whereas I don't, I don't feel like it, I'm, uh, I'm unfamiliar with it having been uh, stormwater being associated with a, just a simple boundary adjustment, you know, that that's not usually when it does kick in. Um, although it sounds like it might've from you previously. And I, I don't know about that, but um, so, I mean, I, I, I I think everybody's certainly got stormwater in the forefront of their minds at this point, you know, um, and certainly any future development, I think, would would cause a review of that. Really? Yeah, I mean, I think that, the you know, feasibly, there could be a way and a configuration of the adjustment of this line um, that could uh, make it more difficult to install, uh, you know, stormwater systems when it comes to the development of, uh, you know, one of these lots. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I think that would be the sort of focus of our review um, here, if any, um, when it comes to stormwater. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, it's important that, you know, your 50 foot easement there for the access road, um, that's pretty standard that provides plenty of space for, um, you know, any type of upgrades that might be necessary for development related to stormwater, um, you know, along a road accessing um, the lot one. Um, so, um, yeah, I think it's, it's it's great points to ask that question at this at this juncture. Uh, and but uh, you know, be on notice that yes, those reviews are very uh, um, very detailed uh, when it comes to the time for you know development in the next phase of anything. Uh, any more questions, comments from board members in this application? I'm I feel feel satisfied. <laughs> I had a oh, go ahead, Alex. I don't have any questions germane to this particular application, but I'm totally mystified why the adjustment we're being asked to make wasn't the one that was set up in 2003 or whenever the lots were divided. Why didn't the I'll, I'll be glad to answer that. In 2003, we thought we would build this house and then build another house on the second Got lot. It. Got but it. our lives have changed. And so this is our home. <laughs> right. So you wanted the easement with where you plan to live. Eventually. Yes. Got it. Yes. We were much younger then. <laughs> were we all? <laughs> I had a question more for Meredith on procedure as we move from the discussion into an action. I know we have the recommended action from the staff report. You know, we discussed the easement just as we were sort of setting the stage for this. Just curious as to whether there would traditionally be any clarification around the easement in, um, in the language on the action. Uh so, I mean, it says as presented in the application, I guess you could add in um, to transfer the land, comma, uh, the 50.1 feet of frontage um, and the utility and access easement from to the other. It's putting in the transfer of the easement is a little bit funkier because the original easement was a different width. Um, so, I mean, you could fit the easement in there somewhere in that sentence. 
it is it is included in the application though so that right. if we reference the application we could just we could go with that yeah and that's why i said as presented in the application and supporting materials so i think i think it's it's clear that that's rolled in if you're transferring the frontage and the land and would it be also be covered by the survey plan yes yeah i mean it's that's the survey plot that's being approved right so that would be on record yeah. for public view yeah I mean, I think uh, given that it's the same order for both lots at this juncture, um, I don't see a reason to necessarily include it. If it was different owners at this point, I would think that putting in the condition execution of the easement part of approval um, would be my move. Um, yeah, but I mean, here, we, here we can also, I mean, we, we required, you know, recording of the um, easement language with the plat for the subdivision um, recently on, uh, yeah. Oh. So um, that could be another condition um, that the, the easement be recorded at the same time as the plot. That's not a bad point. Um, because that way we know it happens, right? Versus it just not happening. And so that easement is not officially created. I mean, you have it, it says proposed easement on the survey plat. It doesn't actually say the easement. And once the easement is recorded, it's there, it's attached to the land. It doesn't matter about the owners. So thank you for catching that miss. So that, that would be my re recommendation. So we should add language to the motion saying to to incorporate the um, the newly defined easement. Yeah, I think that should be one of the conditions. So if you give me just a minute, oh goodness. Yeah. I gotta go back to five seven vine. Um, so, uh, So we could probably add at the end. So I'll shall record one final survey plat, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and then two and two, um, the access and utility easement approved herein. Did you get that, Catherine? Oh, I don't know if I got the exact language. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't have it in front of me. So hold, hold on. Not being I say it again. I do have yeah, my pen hold, right here. Hold, hold on so. one second. I can also, if, I mean, yeah. So, uh, uh, so in the, the condition of approval, after it says applicant shall record, put in a little number one before the final survey plat. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, do an and two, the access and utility easement approved herein. And that way the language for that easement needs to get recorded when the survey plat is recorded. And that's that's within 180 days. So within six months, Bill and Jean. So you've got time to get a, a lawyer to draft up exactly how that easement language looks. Yes, it might be minutia, but we're not technically necessarily approving the easement. You know, maybe we're saying that, you know, we're requiring the execution of the easement as shown on the as shown on the survey plat. Yeah proving the adjustment. Yep, that way we're not we're not adjusting the land, having that get recorded and then the easement 
not happening um, to grant the access and the utility right of way. Yeah. This quick question, man, is it possible to use the same wording that was in the subdivision? Just change 25 feet to 50 feet? Uh, I, I would run it by an attorney. Mm. I, I would, because I mean, that was, uh, that was, you know, 20 years ago. Um, I would run it by an attorney. Mm. Okay. I mean, you have, you have that prior language. Um, so they should be able to, that has all the references to the deeds and everything. Mm -hmm. They should be yeah. able to take that and tweak it based on the new um, yeah. configuration pretty quickly. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Yeah. Any further comments or questions? I'll accept a motion. I'll second the motion. Oh. <laughs> How about let's have it somebody make it first? Make the motion. <laughs> yeah. Catherine, oh, I think you're Bob, the one who has it written down. I think down. I can try for the motion, but Meredith, can you jump in if I didn't catch it quite right? Uh, sure. <laughs> when, when we get to the discussion part, I'll I'll flag if anything yeah. didn't get. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry. My, there's a reason I usually come in person. My kids are all like screaming in the background right now. So anyway, uh, um, so motion to approve. Uh, I'll make a motion to approve the requested boundary line adjustment to transfer 23,521 square feet of land and 50.1 feet of frontage from parcel one to six Parkside Drive as presented in application number Z 2023-0078 and supporting materials subject to the following condition of approval. Within 180 days of permit issuance, applicant shall record the final survey plat in the Montpelier Land Records Office per the procedures detailed in 4405 of zoning regs as modified by section 3510 for boundary line assessment adjustments, including the locations of all applicable survey rods and markers and to the access and utility easement contained therein. I would second that motion. All righty, motion from Catherine, second by Sharon. Um, all right, so we have any discussion here um, to refine it um, or do folks feel that it hits the nail on the head? I think it hits the nail on the head. Yeah, and shorter than what I proposed. Yeah. Hey, well, done, Meredith, I have a quick question for you, Meredith. Yeah. Um, with the easement, the property owner having both parcels and then putting an easement across the parcels doesn't doesn't the easement distinguish with a merger? I'm confused um, how we can have an easement over ownership of two parcels that he owns. Right, but he, he currently owns them, but they're separate parcels. They are legally distinct parcels since the subdivision um, in 2003 or 2005. Um, and so, ooh, I mean, we did this with Vine Street where the easement was created because it's in relation from one, one parcel to another, um, you know, and this allows for the sale of the other parcel. But are we sure that we're not over... If we're going to make him go get an easement now, are we are we sure that we're not over complicating this for the attorney that he goes to and potentially increasing his legal expenses? <laughs> um, the problem is we've had so I'm just going to flag this out there um, that we've had situations where we've had subdivisions. And then the original easement was never recorded. So that easement never actually happened. Um, and so somebody could have then sold that property without that easement having been in place if it was to someone who is not a, a um, savvy, savvy, yeah, savvy property purchaser. Um, 
And so I, I mean, given, uh, given the guidance I've gotten from city council, I, I honestly don't think that this is, I, I think this is the way we need to go. Um, if you think requiring that it be recorded in 180 days, the easement being recorded if you think that's up too far and think that yeah i, I, I mean i mean i, I, I think we should drop my preference is to drop the easement language if he were to sell this parcel or put a home on it then sell it he would have to then put an easement on the parcel i think we're i think we're over complicating this potentially well, so, so can i just flag something right so if you go back right to our sub the subdivision regulations um no actually the front if we do this without the easement being in place we're in violation of the zoning regulations and the frontage requirement so in section 3002 street frontage and the, an existing parcel which currently lot one, the one in the rear, the bigger one is existing. An existing parcel um, without the minimum required frontage must have access to the public or private street over an easement or right of way approved by the DRB. So we can say that there's a proposed easement, but unless we somehow require that that easement get recorded, there's, there's no easement until it's recorded. Is the so way I look at it. Yeah, it's also a vacant parcel. I mean, I, I think I personally think the the language that you originally had is good enough and it's clear and concise. And to Rob's earlier point, I think we're overcomplicating this with a mandatory easement language. And, but and my preference would be to just keep it simple. I think we all I want to approve this. I think we all do. I'm just concerned that we might create more headaches for this landowner. Then we all want to. Okay. Um, Some of the plats, or maybe all the plats, do distinguish it as easement in common. I'm not sure how that applies to what we're discussing. But I well, certainly you own both parcels, though. But yeah, I certainly appreciate Michael your your point of view, and and it's very sympathetic to our plight in just wanting to make this as simple and as possible to bring it up to date to current living conditions. And that's all we wanna do really. And, and I, I really um, respect your speaking out to this issue and thank you very much to considering the financial issues of decisions that are made by the DRB um, as, and, and not only in, in present, but in future as well. So thank you, Michael. I think uh, obviously, we, we certainly agree with your point and think it could be handled in a much simpler and less costly way and, and almost penalizing us for, for the situation. So thank you. Well, Michael, Michael, I see where you're coming from. <laughs> but the more I look at it, the more I lean towards, uh, I think it's good that we just require and execute it right away. Um, I think, you know, for one, there's an existing easement that provides access to the existing configuration of lot one. Um, well, you know, we're, we're adjusting the boundary. So in effect, we're adjusting that, e you know, that easement mm -hmm. um, and that requiring a new one <laughs> uh, that clearly, you know, voids the old um, and uh, makes it very clear so that the moment at which lot one sells, it's ready to go. There are no um, issues whatsoever and just abundantly clear um, of what the access is and what the rights are. Um, and I think, you know, Meredith made a good point that if this were a brand new subdivision, that would be our process um, for, um, you know, documentation required um, at the time of recording the, um, uh, you know, the survey plat. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> I, I guess I would also just add that, um, that, as the application is presented, it's simply changing, you know, it's swapping the frontage from one property to another, swapping the easement from one property to another, and that those are all the pieces that are that are happening there. And that if we suddenly are not 
recording an easement or that's just not part of it, then that's a much bigger change, you know, and overall. So that to me, to make it the sort of simple boundary adjustment that it is, we need to make sure that it is just swapping over so that the easement is recorded properly for the other property. And I, I don't know, I think it's important. I think otherwise it would be a cloud on title. Yeah, it could be. For right. sure. If it didn't end up getting recorded at all, it would be a cloud on title because there'd be a question of whether or not the right. lot one had any rights to get to the road. Exactly. So in a sense, we're protecting the Jolly's interest in that other parcel as well. And the and ability to... Take, I don't want to overcomplicate it, Meredith. I'm, I would vote yes on this, this application, but... In that scenario, you could just handle that at closing. You could just create the easement at the transaction. But either way, I, um, I, I'll i defer to Meredith. I vote yes, even though I've now muddled this up. And, um, <laughs> yeah, but I just think uh, these things are complex enough and the simpler, the better. Yeah. I, I suppose all this is assuming that there will be some kind of transfer of this property to another ownership. If there's not, isn't this all a mute point? Well, mm -hmm. okay, we're getting old. <laughs> yeah. hey. that's, that's immaterial. Um, I mean, that, that's my point. It, it, this makes the presumption that there will be some transfer of ownership. And if there's not, this is all a mute point. Right, so, but it is still a separate parcel, you know? I mean, I think that's what... Meredith, I mean, what's very convincing to me is that it is a separate parcel. So the potential for a sale is always there, whether it's with you guys or the guys after you or however that works. It'd be good to have it tidy. Yeah. I mean, no sale. <laughs> what does no sale do to this argument? Okay, don't go there. Yeah, we, well, he, so, so Bill, the, the the problem is we have to we have to prepare for all of the eventualities. If you were never ever going to sell, you could have merged it back into one parcel, and it mm -hmm. would have just been me, right? So, because you want to keep them separate and you want to make this transfer, we have to actually check all the boxes. In my point of view, the board the board can make its decision how it wants to, and I have to follow that, and that's the decision I write and the permit I issue, because at this point, it's the board's permit. Um, my, my personal, the way I do things is check the boxes, dot the I's, and then later on, there's no questions, and there aren't, um, you don't have conflicting documents where you have a, you know, you get a, a, a plat recorded, but then the rest of the legal stuff doesn't get recorded because something happens, right? There's another big, there's, you have something go on, you know, records get lost. You only recorded one. You didn't get around to the easement. Something happens. Somebody else has the property. They go to try and sell, but there's no easement, right? Um, this just sort of sets it up um, and makes sure it's all set in stone so that it's easier to, if you want to transfer, deal with it. Um, the, the board, you know, the board can do, can approve what it wants. Um, I try and guide as best as possible to go as close to the regulations as we can. That's a good policy. Mm -hmm. Any more discussion? On the motion. Seeing none, um, I will do a roll call vote here. Um, Sharon, how do you vote? Yes. Um, Catherine, how do you vote? Yes. Alex? Yes. Brian? <laughs> Muted. Michael. Yes. Rob, myself votes yes. Brian, can you unmute yourself and vote yes or no? I wonder if we lost him somehow. Okay. We but have that still was five. Technical difficulties. We have five and uh, we have one uh, not present. Um, I can say sort of abstained. Not available. Yes, sure. Perfect. Um, so that is um, 
approved um, with five yeses and one abstention. And um, yeah, thank you, uh, Bill and Jean, for uh, for coming in. Thank you, uh, Mark, for your uh, comments. Uh, appreciate it. And um, we have a couple of hours of business, uh, but that is the end of the uh, Arc uh, Street Parkside Drive application. Thank you both. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, the DRB and everyone, for giving it such thorough thought and, re and review. We appreciated that. We were, frankly, honestly, um, concerned about the future as well and make sure that everything's in place. As you can tell from the 2003 and 2005 setup, that uh, much of this was anticipated. And, uh, and therefore, we, we, we understand and recognize the need to do that. So, again, thank you very much. And... Uh, uh, Michael, again, thank you very much uh, for your thoughts and, and uh, support. Um, and with that, Meredith, I guess uh, the next time we speak uh, will be uh, about the uh, review that we need to put forth to follow up with the conditions. Uh, yep. So there's what, what's going to happen next is um, I will work with Rob on a written decision that will memorialize everything that happened tonight. Um, and so we'll, when that's ready, we'll also issue the permit and I will probably email you just because of mail issues to have you come and, and come to our new offices to pick those up. Okay. Um, and then, um, yeah, you'll work with, with Rick and whoever your attorney is to get the final survey plat on Mylar to be recorded and the easement and we'll go from there, but okay. we'll, we'll work on those final bits, um, together. Okay. Well, thank you. We, thank you. Yes. You know, I know how to find you. I will see yes, you. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds you. good, Bill. Okay. Well, thank you to you both of you. Meredith, uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Good night. Have a nice evening. You too. Thank you. You too. Okay. Thank you. On to the next. Um, so we have uh, two uh, sets of meeting minutes to approve this evening. Um, one is from June 5th. And... It appears that we do have a quorum. Mm. No? No, Maybe. you need to have four for a quorum. Three. We do not have a quorum for that one. Uh, okay. But you have your new, uh, didn't we change our rules of procedure? We do. I. Um, so that you don't have to have a full quorum, right? Was yes. That one of the things I did? This is two months old, so I uh, <laughs> I do uh, think that we should uh, address this uh, if there's not any objections from. You've got three. <laughs> it's three of three of the four that were there, um, and new members of the board. So um, without an objection, uh, I would accept a motion for approval of these minutes unless there's any changes. I'll make a motion to approve. A second. Motion by Sharon, second by Alex. Um, all right, Sharon, how do you vote? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Alex? Yes. Uh, Brian? Yes. Michael? <laughs> You're back. No. And uh, Rob, myself votes yes. Um, Michael, was that a yes or a no? Uh, I would, yes, I wasn't at that particular one, but yes. So you can abstain. Abstain, That's so fine. I, I trust you, Meredith. I'll, I'll put a <laughs> yes next to your name. <laughs> uh, all right. We have a minutes. Uh, minutes are approved from uh, the uh, what was that? The fifth. Yep. Yes. All righty. Uh, next order of business will be the minutes from six nineteen. Uh, all right. Um, we'll at least discuss who was there and who was not. I believe that uh, Michael. Alexander and Rob and uh, Sharon. We have four for this one at least. Uh, so uh, with this one, let's just only vote if you were there. Um, so I'll only call a roll call for the people that were there. Um, we have a motion uh, for approval of the minutes from June 19th. So moved. All right. Um, motion Second. from Alex. Second from Sharon. Um, so um, Sharon, how do you vote? Yes. Uh, Michael? Yes. Alex? Yes. And Rob, myself, votes yes. Um, and um, Catherine and 
Uh, Brian, you okay with this abstention yeah. since you were not there? Yeah, I'm happy to abstain since I wasn't there. So. Yes, Wonderful. that's fine. Great. Two abstentions and um, four in the affirmative. Awesome. Great. Uh, I think we have, have, have succeeded. <laughs> I might make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> oh, wonderful. That is great. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.